Hi, everybody. Today we're going to talk about uh, the solution function and the value function uh, for an optimization problem. So let's uh, start off by just laying out a generic optimization. We'll do a maximization problem. Uh, and then we'll go through the solution function, the value function. We'll go through uh, a couple of examples. So uh, kind of typical or prototypical uh, optimization problem. We're just going to give it the name P for the, our problem. And that's going to be to maximize some objective function. And now I'm writing an x and a theta here. Um, the x here represents decision variables, and the theta represents parameters, something that the decision maker is outside the decision maker's control. The decision maker is going to be choosing the decision variable x, and so we're maximizing, or the decision maker here is maximizing over some set capital X of available uh, alternative uh, choices, alternative decisions, little x. And uh, let's point out that this is, of course, the objective function. And uh, let's uh, go on a little further here to say that we're going to be maximizing this objective function subject to one or more constraints. So let's put that down here and let's say we have subject to some function capital G also uh, depending on our decision variables, the values of the decision variables, and typically also depending in some way on the parameters. And that's a constraint because the value of the g function has to be less than or equal to some number, and we can just normalize by making that a zero. And this may be a multidimensional function. That is, this g may have multiple um, components, so we would have to then make this the zero vector. And so, uh, as I said uh, before, uh, the x's here are going to be the decision variables for our decision maker. And the thetas, so this is a little x, lowercase x, and lowercase theta, those are going to be uh, parameters and so the decision variables are something that the decision maker chooses so chooses the values of the decision variables but the parameters uh, say theta 1, theta 2, theta 3, because there may be multiple parameters. The parameters, the decision maker has to take as given because they're so exogenous to the decision maker. They're outside the decision maker's control. Now, again, in just a few moments, we're going to do a couple of examples here to sort of uh, particularize this generic general framework. Uh, but let's say a few more words about this before we go to the examples. So. One thing I want to say is that the decisions are chosen. That is, the, the decision, uh, the decision, the values of the decision variables. So the decision is chosen from a set of possible decisions. And the thetas, we haven't said anything yet about where the thetas live and what, what, what the thetas could be. So let's write that in here as well. So let's say this is the decision maker is going to choose an x that maximizes his objective function subject to this constraint or this set of constraints for some value of theta. So again, I say for some value of theta, uh, 
because that's a specific given number or vector. So this is for some theta in, so this is a capital theta, uppercase theta, for some theta in the set of possible available um, values of the parameters. And typically, most of the time, I would say we see certainly problems where this isn't so, but usually the vast majority of cases that we're going to be interested in, certainly in this course, we have capital X is a subset of Euclidean space, let's make it Rn, and capital theta is also a subset of a Euclidean space, not necessarily the same dimension. So uh, we'll say usually here. But let's note, though, that uh, we say usually, but this can be uh, any sets. So the, the capital X and the capital theta or, and or the capital theta could simply be finite sets, could be the set of integers because the individual cannot choose among a continuum of choices but can only choose whole numbers uh, for his choices and so on. So they could be any sets uh, but they're usually, well I guess the integers in fact would be a subset of R. So usually the sets um, of available uh, alternative decisions and the sets of possible parameter values are elements of Euclidean space. So this is the sort of, this is the framework. This is the generic uh, setup, the generic maximization problem with decision variables and parameters. Um, with an objective function and a constraint function, and inequality constraints. Now, let's go over here and start out with uh, a kind of prototypical example of this. And of course, I'm going to use uh, an example that we've used several times already. It's sort, of, it's sort of the workhorse example for lots of things we do in economics having to do with optimization, and that's the utility maximization problem for the consumer, uh, the cons or the consumer maximization problem that uh, is the, the foundation of demand theory. So let's say over here we have the utility maximization problem, and that's going to be where the consumer chooses uh, a bundle of goods and we're going to do this here for just two goods so we can draw a picture and so the subscripts don't kind of get out of control a little bit. So we'll say uh, these max the consumer's maximizing utility function, which depends on only two variables. So there's only two goods in this sort of simplified version of the problem. And so over here, we have uh, subject to x in R two plus, so x of course here is x1, x2, so let's just write it here, x equals x1, x2, and of course we model the consumer as choosing this bundle subject to a budget constraint. So let's write the budget constraint in here, we have p1, x1, p2, x2 less than or equal to whatever the income or the budget is that the consumer has to spend on, uh, on purchasing the two goods. And so let's uh, first identify in our consumer decision problem, the utility maximization problem, let's first identify what items in the utility maximization problem are playing the roles of the various items in the uh, in the, the kind of the pattern problem, the generic problem, <laughs> the general problem. And so, of course, x here is playing the role of x over here. So coincidentally, in this case, the 
same notations being used for the decision variables here as we have in general. And of course, uh, this is capital X. So the set of possible um, decisions the consumer could take are in R2 plus because the consumer, we say, can't choose negative amounts of either of the goods. And let's, uh, let's actually rewrite this inequality because you'll notice that in the generic problem, we have a, the zero vector on the right. We have only one constraint. So in this problem here, this capital G would only have be a one component function. So in this case, the G, the target space, would just be the real. So it'd be, this G will be a real valued function over here. But the right hand side is M, but of course I can simply uh, take the inequality out here and put minus M less than or equal to zero. And now we have exactly the same uh, constraint, but I've written it with the the entire function, all the variables and parameters on the left-hand side, and the zero on the right-hand side like this. But again, there's only the one constraint, so that's just a, the number zero, not the zero vector. And so, of course, this, this, and this, the prices of the two goods and the income or wealth or budget of the consumer, those are the parameters in the utility maximization problem, the items over which the consumer has no control, takes these as given. Now, of course, the consumer taking the market prices as given is okay, <laughs> clear enough. You could say, well, wait a minute, the consumer has some control over this budget, over his income, by he could work more or whatever. So what we'd say about that is a couple of things. One, we could say that, sure, the consumer could do that, and we could then roll those decisions about how much to work in order to generate income, how much income to put in here. Uh, we could make those decision variables. Uh, but then let's also say that here, we're just treating the consumer as if he's already made the decision uh, or he already knows externally, exogenously, what the amount he can spend will be. And so we're treating this as if that's a parameter, as a given, even though we might then say the consumer might want to ask himself, well, how will my decision change if I allocate more or less to this problem? And we're going to come back and see that in just a moment. So for the problem here, each of these is a parameter. So we have here that theta is equal to, and so let me here, go back to this color because I'm using this color for this problem. And here I'm using theta, like I used x and x here, to identify what in this problem is playing the role of the various constituent um, items over here. So here we have that theta is equal to P1, P2, and M, and that's going to be in R3 plus because None of these parameters can take on negative values, no negative prices, no negative wealth or income here. So here we have theta is going to be this vector in this problem here, and R3 plus is playing the role of the uppercase theta over here in the general problem. So this would be the uppercase theta in our general problem over here. And of course, obviously, uh, U is playing the role of F. That's the objective function. And there's one more thing to notice. In the general problem, the objective function depends on the decisions being taken, the values of the X variables, and also in general can depend on the parameters. Over here, I haven't got the utility function depending on any of the parameters because we typically model the consumer as having preferences, utility function, uh, that the preference of the consumer doesn't depend on the market prices and his wealth. The preferences just depend on what he consumes. 
and so we would write this here. And so this just, I mean, we could write theta in over here, but the u doesn't depend on theta, so there's no point in writing it in. So uh, this is just a special case of the situation over here. So in this problem, the parameters only enter the problem through the constraint, the single constraint, not through the objective function as they can over here. We're going to come back in a moment and see a second example where the objective function will actually uh, depend not only on the decisions but also on the parameters. So let's draw a quick little diagram of what's going on here. Of course, we're quite used to this. This is nothing new going on here. So I'm just going to write a little diagram over here on the right. And so here we have uh, the possible decisions represented by the non-negative quadrant in R2. And we have the consumers. Well, in fact, let me first put in the, uh, uh, the constraint. So the consumer, let's say, is facing a budget constraint that looks like this. And so let's just write this in here. This is p dot x, and here I'll write my, uh, here I'll write less than or equal to m, even though we know I could have written p dot x minus m less than or equal to zero. And we have the consumer's preference represented by a utility function, and he's maximizing, and so we know from what we've just done recently that the first order conditions for the decision here to be a solution of our maximization problem, the first order condition uh, or conditions will be that the that if this is the gradient of the constraint function, and in fact, let me even point out here, I guess I left one thing out when I was saying what items over here play the role of the items over here. This is clearly playing the role of g of x and theta. And by the way, I've, you'll notice I've used a semicolon here, and I've used the semicolon here, and the semicolon here. That's not, I think, standard. I do that often with the problems like this to just simply emphasize the distinction between these variables and these variables. That they're like different kinds of variables. These are parameters. These are decision variables. But it wouldn't be wrong to just write a comma there. That would be fine. Um, I guess I could also say the semicolon kind of emphasizes that these um, are multidimensional and in different spaces. So this, for example, in our problem here is uh, usually something in Rn, an n-dimensional vector, and this is typically an m-dimensional vector. And so that's the case here. n is 2. Might even point that out. n over here is 2, and m over here is 3. And so we know that our first, coming back to the problem here, we know that our first order condition here is that the, the uh, gradient of the objective function is going to be some multiple of the gradient of the constraint function. And that's exactly what's going on in the picture. And of course, that's one representation of the idea that there's a tangency between the uh, level curve or indifference curve uh, of the objective function and the level curve of the constraint function. And so I'm going to use x hat here for the optimal choice. I guess I haven't had occasion to use that over here yet. So the first thing I want to look at here for our consumer problem, utility maximization problem, is the, what we call the solution function. You recall that I said that, that this uh, lecture is all about the solution function and the value function. And, okay, the solution function is finally showing up here. The solution function is the function that tells us 
the solution of our problem as a function of the parameters of the problem. So that would be a function in which we have x hat, the optimal choice here, as a function in this case of p1, p2, and m. And more generally, I have Maybe I shouldn't say it more generally, but I just want to write it as a function here. This is going to be uh, a function from R3 plus the parameter space, the set of parameters, into R2 plus the choices. The choices are in R2 plus, the parameters are in R3 plus, and of course, this is the consumer's demand function. Notice that it's, or you could think of it as the consumer's demand functions for the various goods. In this case, there's two goods, and so this, this actually represents the demand functions for both of the goods because x hat's a vector here. x hat gives me a vector in R2, so it tells me the consumer's demand for each of the two goods as a function of the prices and his income or wealth. And um, so let's just stop for just a second for me to point out something here that uh, maybe I should have pointed out just a little bit earlier, and that is that we're doing everything here for two goods and therefore two prices. And that's partly because that allows us to draw the diagram, so we're familiar with that. Um, gives us something to kind of get our hands on, to get a hold of. Uh, and we're also doing it because it, it's kind of simple in terms of the number of variables and so on. But, and of course, if we did everything for just the two variables, the two goods, this would look pretty much just like intermediate microeconomics in your undergraduate economics program. But of course, the power of what we're doing here and here is that this actually enables us to do all the same kinds of things, answer all the same kind of questions, do the same kind of analysis for any number of goods. We can't draw the pictures once we get beyond two goods, but we can do the analysis, uh, we can do the econometric estimation, we can do the modeling for any number of goods by using this kind of framework over here as a framework for setting up our decision problems and working through them. So here we have our solution function, and notice that I mentioned that the, sol the solution here came from the first order conditions over here, an equation. And so let me actually uh, put a different color around that to emphasize this here. This is an equation, and since there are two variables, this vector, this gradient, has two components. This has two components. So this is a vector equation. It's an equation with two, um, it's, it, it's a vector equation representing two uh, equations with just numbers in them. So this comes from, let's, uh, let me continue to use this other color here. This comes, of course, from, as the solution of the first order conditions equations. The first order conditions which are equations. Here I've written it as one, but it's a vector equation, so that's a list of equations, one for each of the, each of the uh, variables. And so the solution of our first order conditions gives us the the decision, the choice that the consumer makes, gives us the demand function. And so let's come back over here now and write down the same thing, really, but in general. So over here, we have the solution function of our general maximization problem, and it's really the same thing. It's going to be x hat is our optimal value of this vector here, our optimal vector value, and that depends on the parameters. So as we change the parameters values around, we're going to change the optimal 
solution, just like over here. If we change the prices or the income, the budget, we're going to change the consumer's optimal choice. And so the optimal choice depends on those values. And that's the same thing here. And let's just point out that the function is a function from the parameter space, the set or space of possible parameter values, into the decision space, the choice space, the, the space or set of possible values of the decision variables. And that typically comes from what? How are we typically going to come up with our optimal uh, values of the decision variables? That is the solution, the solution of our problem. Same as over here. This is the special case of the consumer problem. This is the general problem. This is going to come from the first order conditions, which are typically equations. So that's how things work for the consumer's demand problem, demand function, utility maximization problem. But that's just a special case of how things work in general. Let's come back over here and look at the the value function for this optimization problem. The value function is a function that tells us the value of the objective function as a function of the parameters. The solution function tells us as a function of the parameters what's the best decision, what's the best choice for values of our decision variables. The value function tells us the resulting optimal value of our objective function as a function of the parameters. So that means this is going to be V of P1, P2, and M. But that's clearly the utility level that we get in this problem. The utility level the consumer achieves is obviously going to be the utility level at the X's that the consumer chooses as a relative result of the parameters. So in fact, we could even point out that this indifference curve here is the utility at x1 hat, x2 hat. And so down here, this is going to be the utility achieved at x hat of p1, p2, and m. And in general, this will depend on the parameters directly as well, but here it won't. I'm going to leave a little space here. Uh, this is, we don't need the space. I just left the space because I'm going to stick something in there just to, to describe something. And so this is the, the value of the objective function at the optimal solution as a function of the parameters. So that depends on the parameters. And um, let's go over here and say, in general, same thing. The value function is going to be um, V, which will depend on theta. Let me even point out, let me even write this with a colon here to emphasize this is defined to be the value of the objective function, like over here, at the optimal values of the decision variables, that would be x hat over here as well because we're using the same notation for the decision variables in the general problem as the, as the UMP problem, uh, which is a function of the thetas. But in general, the objective function depends not just on the decision variables, but also on maybe one or more or all of the parameters. So I have to put the parameters in here as well, because f depends on x and on theta, and maybe even put the semicolon in there, so it looks just like up here. And so over here, the thetas don't appear in the utility function, as I pointed out a little earlier. So 
no, uh, no theta here in this problem. But that's just because the utility maximization problem, the consumer problem, we usually model utility or preferences as not depending on the parameters. And I should maybe say as an aside that there has been some economics done. I don't know there's been much done recently because it was all sort of done earlier and it's not all that interesting and it's pretty straightforward. But about, gee, it must be 30 or 40 years ago now, quite a while ago, there was a little bit of flurry of activity where some economists were, uh, were framing the problem as one in which a consumer's preferences might depend on prices, might depend on income. And so actually put in parameters into the utility function. So these thetas, the elements of theta, actually entered the utility function, and so they would enter here as well. But that's not the standard model we use, and I'm trying here to keep everything simple, standard, familiar, and straightforward. So the utility function would not depend on prices and income, that is, would not depend on the parameters. So uh, now we have a pretty complete picture here of our utility maximization problem and our general problem, but I want to say one more thing before we go on to a second example, and that is what we are often interested in is how the decision makers, in this case the consumers, how the consumers' decisions, how the consumers' behavior, observed behavior, choices, will be affected when we change any of the parameters, or when, not we change, but when any of the parameters changes. So, for example, how does the consumer's uh, consumption or purchases of the first good change if I change the price of that good, or if I change the price of the other good? Or if I change the consumer's income, what's the consumer's response uh, to a change in income? And so what I would want to know in that case is I would want to know, for example, the derivative or derivatives of the x's, how those change when these things change. So I would want to know, let's say, the change in x when I change theta. And so I'm just using x here as a general uh, notation for the various x's here and the theta for the various things here. So this derivative here would be the kind of thing we want to know about and that would come uh, from applying the implicit function theorem to the first order condition equations. Now that's something we haven't done yet but this is a bit of a motivation for what we're going to do very shortly, which is we are going to look at, the, in some detail, the implicit function theorem and how we use it in economics. And this is the first prototypical example of how that's going to work. So when we want to know about the, how the decisions change in response to changes in the consumer's environment, parameters, that means we're asking about a derivative like this. So, for example, this might be change in x1 due to a change in, let's say, p2, or p1, or m. Um, and so, we do that by taking our equations, our first order condition equations, that's two equations in our problem here with two variables, our first order condition equations, and we want to see uh, how the equations, of course, involve both the decision variables and the parameters. Uh, and so we need to apply the implicit function theorem to those equations to pull out uh, the effect of the parameters changing on the changes in the decision variables. And that's what's going to happen over here as well. So over here, in general, we would say we will look at the changes in our decisions uh, by looking at the, by applying the implicit function theorem to the first order condition equations. Let me here just emphasize these are equations. 
and I guess I could say the thing, same thing over here, these are equations. What about down here? Well, for the consumer problem, it's not completely obvious why we want to know how the utility level changes uh, because the utility numbers, we don't really think the utility numbers are that important. It's just the preferences that are important. But I'll, I'll come back to that in just a moment. So in general, we want to know the same thing about the value function. Let me say, for example, suppose that this problem here now wasn't the, the consumer's problem, but let's say that the problem of the firm maximizing profit, which is the next example we're going to look at in just a moment. And then this would be a profit function. And I very much want to know, uh, I might want to know for the firm, how its profit is going to be affected by changes in the environment, the market environment that it faces. So here, if we want to know the change in V with respect to theta, which of course is the change in the objective value with respect to theta, you could say, well, look, I'll just take the derivative of the objective function with respect to the particular theta I'm interested in. That'll tell me how f changes when theta changes, but that wouldn't be correct because when theta changes, it's certainly true that it changes the objective value directly, but when theta changes, it also changes the decision we take, and so we have to take that into account somehow uh, when we are uh, looking at how the objective value changes when I change a parameter. And so this is done via what we call the envelope theorem, which again, we haven't done yet, but we're going to do shortly. So as I said, this is going to provide some motivation uh, and a kind of uh, example uh, as a vehicle for learning the implicit function theorem shortly. And similarly, this example and this general framework will be a vehicle for learning about the envelope theorem shortly as well. And so it turns out that while, you know, we're not really interested that much in the utility number that the consumer achieves because it's preferences that really matter, not I mean, the utility function is somewhat arbitrary. We could make monotone transforms of the utility function and we would still be describing the same preferences and we would get out the same demand behavior. But it turns out that in demand theory and consumer theory, there actually is uh, some real value to knowing how the utility function changes when we change the parameters. In fact, let me even point out that this is called the consumer's, let's say, the consumer's indirect utility function. And that plays a real role in demand theory. And so, how do we find out about that? How do we find about how the, uh, the utility level changes when we change the consumer's environment, the parameters he faces? Uh, again, we get, say, I'm just rewriting what I wrote over here, the change in V is a function of the change in theta, i.e., uh, or let's just say, for example, uh, change in U, when I have a change in, let's say, one of the prices, and that we get, again, via the envelope theorem. So this now is a pretty complete um, story about a very standard example that you're going to spend a lot of time working through and analyzing in your first course uh, in the first semester of your program in microeconomics. And the general framework of which this is just one special case over here. And so you're going to see this. This is basically the essence of most of microeconomics, actually, is analyzing problems uh, that fit into this framework. We're typically model, we typically model uh, economic agents, 
uh, whether they're firms or consumers or governments or countries or what, whatever you like, the decision makers um, as maximizing or minimizing an objective function, often subject to constraints. And so we, this is a, a pattern for how we'll proceed. So now I think we will take off our consumer problem example and uh, we'll kind of finish up by going a little more quickly, I think, through a second example uh, that we'll put on the screen over here, but we'll, we'll keep the general framework over here. So let's take this off now, okay?